Namaste, and welcome to this evening's continuation of the discussion of the Bhagavad Gita. My name is Nayaswami Jaya, and for some of you who have been with us for the previous programs, you'll remember that we had begun a Bhagavad Gita discussion with Nayaswami Asha some months ago, but we were forced to discontinue that because of scheduling conflicts. But after a month or six weeks absence, we've decided to start up the programs once again, but this time we'll be continuing these with myself on Friday nights, and also in those times when I'm not able to be with you, uh, Nayaswami Devarshi will also be filling in for me. We're going to be studying the Bhagavad Gita and picking up where uh, Ashiji left off. We're going to, this evening, we're going to begin with chapter 2, stanzas 57 and 58. And if we have time, maybe we'll even get to number 59. And we're going to be using as our source material the, this essence of the Bhagavad Gita. This is a, as explained by uh, uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. And as we progress through the Bhagavad Gita, I very much recommend that you purchase this book and have this book with you. Because as I read the stanzas and as I offer commentary on the stanzas, I'll be basing these on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. And the commentaries in this book by Swami Kriyananda are invaluable. And of course, I cannot, the pages and pages of them, I cannot totally do justice to everything that he says. So have this with you and, and use it as a companion piece and if you choose to from week to week you might want to read ahead so that you'll be familiar with what we'll be speaking about each week. This stanzas we're going to be speaking about uh, this evening numbers 57 and 58 we actually need to back up just a little bit be, to understand what the conversation is that Arjuna is having with Krishna at this point. And a few stanzas before, Arjuna had asked Krishna, O oh, Keshava, what are the signs of one who has attained calm wisdom and established in union with God? How does he speak, sit, walk? And in the stanzas that follow, Krishna explains to Arjuna many of the qualities of such a one who's established in wisdom, and he comes and he concludes these qualities with this stanza of 57. He's, Krishna says to Arjuna, He who, under all circumstances, is without attachment and neither elated by goodness nor depressed by evil, is a man of established wisdom. In other words, Krishna is saying, a man, a soul, person, who's not tossed about on the waves of circumstances, on the ups and downs of life, but one who remains centered and is established, centered, firm, and calm in the midst of the, as Paramahansa Yogananda would sometimes say, amidst the, the uh, cataclysm of breaking worlds, one can maintain one's centeredness in the midst of that. And this is the mark of somebody who has attained that wisdom and has attained a depth of understanding. Now, how is that possible? I mean, what uh, 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 things happen outside of us, and if we look at the normal course of events, we look at our own life, we see that that it's very difficult to not be affected by those things that go on around us, the ups and downs of life. But you see, the secret here is given in this very stance itself. One who is without detachment. You could say that the wise is complete in himself. He doesn't desire anything for himself. He has no likes and dislikes in that sense. But he's, he's whole and there's nothing outside of himself that he needs or is, is wanting or is desirous of. So consequently, whether the circumstances are, you might say the worldly man would think favorable or unfavorable, it's not going to be affecting him because his joy is not coming to him from circumstances outside of himself. Now, I'd like to clarify and explore one 
couple of points on that because it's often to the worldly person mysterious how a person could be such as that, not affected by these things. And if one isn't affected, wouldn't such a person be indifferent? Often I think this is a common thought that people have. Well, if I don't desire anything of this world, if, uh, uh, if I'm not attached to what happens, good, bad, positive, and negative, I must not care. There must be a certain indifference. Why should I do anything if I don't have a desire to do something? But again, the secret is given here in the commentary in this case. Swamiji mentions that yes, the, uh, the sage or the wise person is whole in themselves and has no desire for himself. But he does have a desire, in a sense, a desireless desire, because his only desire is to be helpful and to help other people. But he's not indifferent by any means. You could say that uh, if you look at the example of saints throughout history, I'm sure all of you have read biographies or autobiographies of saints, and one thing that is absent in the lives of all saints is indifference. You never find that. They're not indifferent. They're, they're, they're usually joyful. They're, they're full of life, they're energetic, they're wanting to the, uh, uh, to the greatest maximum ability that they have to be able to serve and to, and to work and to help other people. This is the mark of the same. Indifference is hardly that at all. It's, but they may be indifferent to the outward satisfactions of the world, but they're not indifferent to life and they're certainly not indifferent to the travails and the troubles of people around them and the situation that's going on around them. They're highly engaged in that way. It's like Master used to say, Paramahansa Yogananda used to say, a sad saint is a sad saint indeed. Well, you could say the same thing, an indifferent saint is certainly not a saint at all to be totally indifferent. I remember there was a time that Swami Kriyananda spoke of in his life where he had, we went through a, a, a difficult time in his life after his separation from Self-Realization Fellowship because he didn't know how he could serve his guru. It seemed that the blocks his, of, had been erected for his ability to serve other people. And so he was, he, it was a difficult time for him, but he said in the midst of all of those troubles that he had and the catastrophe that it seemingly was for him on the outward side, he said and during that whole time, he always knew that on some very deep level there was this ocean of joy, very calm, underneath. But on the top of the ocean there were these waves of, of perhaps a little bit of doubt as to how he might serve his guru or a little bit of discouragement on the surface. But he said underneath he could always tell that that was there. Look at the life of Paramahansa Yogananda. He was a saint of great vitality, great joy. You look at his guru, of course, Swami Sri Teshwar was a man of wisdom. And outwardly, he didn't seem to be, he didn't seem that outwardly exuberant type of personality as you might see in some saints. But nevertheless, nevertheless, you could see he certainly was not indifferent to life. He, was, he cared deeply for life. And it was because of his care and his wish to serve other people, that Babaji recognized that great desire that he had to be able to share these teachings with other others, that he met him at that story that's told of, it, of Babaji meeting him at the Kumbh Mela and told him that in the years ahead he would send a student to him to be trained, to be able to take these teachings of Kriya Yoga, to reach out to millions of souls around the world. So this is a, this is a, a mark of a great saint. Just to balance that though, it, uh, I remember a story that uh, you know, I'm reminded of this, that Swami met a uh, very elderly sadhu once in Puri. And the sadhu was quite elderly, quite old. And so Swamiji said obviously the sadhu had certain uh, uh, advancement in his spiritual progress, but he was, he was reputed to be a hundred and 30 years old, so obviously if he was, uh, that's remarkable. But he said this sadhu had that, had that disposition of, of advising 
Swamiji in this case and advising those people that came to him for advice to, advice, to not engage in any in involvement in the world, to not enjoy anything. And so Swami was quite surprised at this because this was not the way Paramahansa Yogananda, and you could say it goes a little bit counter to what I'm, I'm saying, but nevertheless, there are exceptions, and this man was one, but because he had some, but he had something else. And so Swamiji asked him, he said, can I not even enjoy a sunset, a beautiful sunset? And this sadhu said, no, not even that. And Swamiji was very respect, uh, respectful to him because obviously the man was, a, was, was an accomplished soul. So he didn't want to, want to argue. But afterwards, uh, after telling that story, Swami said he went away and he said, how dry that is to be able to not even enjoy the beauties of this world. That Paramahansa Yogananda was never like that. He said he enjoyed everything. But he didn't enjoy it outwardly and for its sake. He enjoyed it inwardly because he had found his joy inside. He had been able to discover the source of where our true joy is. And this isn't the case, unfortunately, for most people, and certainly not worldly people who are engaged outwardly, enjoying the world through the senses. To find your pleasures, your happiness outside of yourself it seems the very natural thing to do. It's the natural impulse for us to look around us and we enjoy good food and we enjoy uh, nice weather. We enjoy when circumstances work for our, our benefit. It's, and this seems to be the natural impulse. But when we seek our joy, enjoyment, we seek our happiness outwardly, it's momentary. It can't last because this world simply doesn't support that. Everything in life is in flux. All is change. It's happy one day, it's nice weather one day, sunny, next day it's cold and the rain and the snow comes. You find that things are working favorably one day and the next day they, they don't. Look at your life and look at, look at the you know, circumstances that you've experienced. And this has been attested to by philosophers and saints and sages throughout history that everything changes and the wise man, the wise person is that person who can move with those changes and, and follow, ride those changes but if you put your, you might say your investment of your happiness outwardly into circumstances, you're bound to be disappointed. Paramahansa Yogananda uh, in one of his lessons um, that I remember reading he said that life can be divided into four states. He says you have a person, he's basically he's happy, momentarily at least, followed by he's sad, momentarily at least, but eventually, eventually even sadness will pass, you'll be happy again. But then between these two, just as the wave is going up and it's going down, the ocean level of that middle point, as you go up, you cross that middle point, and then when you come down, you cross that middle point. And he mentioned that you're happy, you're sad, but then everybody at certain points, they're at rest, and there's a peace that comes when they're neither happy nor sad, but it's something of a, when you're not stimulated, there's a momentary passive peace that comes. He says, but that too doesn't last, and eventually that peace stays long enough, and what does it turn into? You become bored. I remember Swami would, would often say, he says, people long for their retirement. Oh, when I'm retired, I'm going to get that lovely little cottage by the sea, and it'll be so nice, the days will be nice, and I can sit out in my yard, and I can look out maybe at the ocean there, and you know, plant my flowers, or whatever it might be, and enjoy that. Well, the time comes, of course, and they're completely bored. I have a, uh, a, an in-law relative who was a very, very busy man, and he was looking so forward to retirement so that he could go and play golf. And every day he just loved golf, and he would go out and play golf. So he, he retired, and six months later I saw him, and I says, how are things? 
And, he's, and it turned out that uh, he was now looking for another job because six months had gone by and that was as much as he could take as he became again. It, it devolves into boredom. Well, this is the state. When we seek that, our pleasures, you might say, or, or to seek our satisfactions outside of ourselves. And that's not where we'll find it. It's inside. The joy is inside. When we see something beautiful outside, you might say you see that you get the new car, you're very happy, but the happiness doesn't reside in the car. It's just a piece of metal. The happiness is inside yourself. It's inside of us. It's in our nervous system. It's perhaps in the brain, wherever it resides. That happiness is our response to what happened outside. And so this Gita number 57 mentions that and now it moves on which I think is to one of the most uh, important uh, if you could say any is more important than the other in the Gita stanzas which is number 58 out of chapter 2 and let me read this it says when the yogi like a tortoise withdrawing its head and limbs into its shell is able to withdraw his energy from the objects of sense perception, he becomes established in wisdom. Now, the reason I'm saying that this is a very important one is perhaps a few reasons. One is here in this one stanza, Krishna basically outlines the purpose for yoga, Kriya Yoga, Raja Yoga, and basically is, it corroborates here or is in sympathy exactly what sage Patanjali says in the Yoga Sutras and the goal of why we meditate one of the one of the goals along the way we withdraw the life force he says like a tortoise if you've all seen a tortoise you know that they they when threatened they withdraw their arms and, and head and legs into their shell away from the outward inwardly and it's in the same way those of us who are seeking joy, seeking happiness, seeking the answer to life, those things that don't change, that are permanent, the secret is not to go out and to seek them out in the circumstances surrounding ourselves, but the secret is, is seemingly exactly the opposite, not out there, but inside. And so we withdraw that life force. We withdraw away from this experiencing life through the senses back into ourselves because we experience it's the senses that experience and transmit those impressions through the nervous system up to the brain and it's in the brain that we begin to experience those well that that happiness or what or that sense of pleasure well what, what yoga does is it says if this is taking place not outside but inside within myself, why not go to the very source and learn to be happy at will rather than dependent upon the changing circumstances that are not under my control. What happens outside of myself I cannot control, but I have the ability if I go to the source of my happiness inside, I have the ability to control my response. And this is the say the essence of Raja Yoga is learning to withdraw. This is the, in the Patanjali's Eightfold Ashtanga of Yoga Path, this is the state of Pratyahara, learning to be able to with interiorize and withdraw and draw that life force in. And when we can do that, then we find that circumstances no longer control us, but rather we begin to circumstances. And so as, as we go through life and, and uh, we, we begin to learn that outer things are, are we cannot control that, but we begin to ask that question, is there anything I can do to be able to control this situation? And this is the key that is provided to us here in this Bhagavad Gita stanza, but also by Patanjali and by the wisdom of the wise and the sages that have passed on to us from, from uh, thousands of years. This is the way to accomplish what we really want, to withdraw that life force in 
into the deep spine, as Paramahansa Yogananda said, this highway and this pathway to self-realization is through our very own nervous system. Now there's, uh, you could say that there's, this is, this is what yoga is representing to us or as, the, as the key, the solution to what our dilemma is. But there's another way that might come to mind also. And, and when, we, uh, uh, when we look at uh, history, we see that people have been searching for this answer. How to overcome this, you might say, temptation of the senses, the sense of the problem of, of enjoying life through the senses. And the first way that is commonly been practiced, and it's a good thing, of course, is to restrain the senses is the senses go out, that life force goes out, and I'm tempted to go in this direction or that direction. I see a wonderful meal and I want to eat more and more of it. That, if we restrain that, and this is the traditional path in, of the monastic path, of the sadhu's path, is, and you could say it's the path of that sadhu that I mentioned, it has value, is to don't enjoy anything. Re restrain yourself from that. But there's a problem with that. We can't leave it simply as blocking the expression of our, the sense the energy is going out toward the world outside. Just to block that energy is not enough. What happens when you block energy? It's like you're putting up a dam to a flow of, a flow of water. The dam begins to build up and the water level begins to rise behind that dam until ultimately it finds an alternate way out. This is so. Just to block that energy is not going to be the solution. We have to be able to transmute that energy to be able to redirect that energy. I remember many years ago a, a story that always stuck with me. To illustrate this a little bit, there were two monks and they were walking in the forest and they were going from one spot to another. And as they walked through the forest, they came onto a stream. And normally this stream did not have much water in it, the pathway went through it, but it had been raining and it was in flood. And so the stream was high. And they came to it and they realized that they would have to wade and ford this stream through the water. But there, as they came to a stream, there was a young woman there. And she was wanting to get to the other side also. And she implored them, oh sirs, good sirs, I need to get home. I need to, this is my home is on the other side and I don't know how I'm going to be able to get across this river. Can you, can you please help me? And so one of the, one of the monks uh, said, I certainly I can help you. And he picked her up and he went into the river and he you know, walked across the stream and placed her on the other side. And the other monk followed and they left her there and they began walking again back to their hermitage. And they walked and they walked and some time had passed. Well, the second monk uh, couldn't restrain himself any longer. And he said to the first monk, he says, he says, shame on you. you there, you, you, that young lady, that young woman, you picked her up and, and uh, a monk shouldn't associate himself like that with women, picking her up and taking her across the river like that. It's it lead you into temptation. And the first monk said to the second monk, Ah, I see. You know, I, I placed that young girl down on the riverbank an hour or, or so ago. I see you've been carrying her ever since. <laughs> and you can see it's not, it's, you know, it's in the mind that was more that one, the one monk, it was just, it was a passing thing. The other monk, his senses, we're going outward, and it's not enough just to block those senses. You need to do more than that. You need to be into true success to be able to overcome temptations, to be able to overcome the attractions of the world. It's not just to block. You have to take it to that next step to be able to withdraw, to withdraw that life force back into the deep spine. And once in that deep spine, we're going to raise that life force in the deep spine being the Shishona. We're going to raise that life force up the spine to the brain. And this in essence is what the path of Kriya Yoga is about. So this is 
why I've often thought of this, this particular stance as one of the most important because he's speaking about the path of Kriya Yoga, the, the, or at least that which Kriya Yoga helps us to do. The life force is going out into the surface of the body and when that happens, we're restless. The mind is restless. And this is the most common problem that people have when they begin to meditate. They try to meditate, but the mind is wandering here, there, or another thing. But through the practice of the techniques of this path of Kriya, we begin to focus the mind. Even the, the, the very beginning basic technique of meditation and concentration that we start with, the Hong Sa technique of meditation, of watching the breath uh, and watching the breath as the inhalation comes into the body and observing that exhalation and following that inhalation with the mantra of Hong and the exhalation with the mantra of Sa, this concentration upon the breath begins to withdraw, calms the breath, calms the breath, calms and slowly it begins to calm the heart, becomes the nervous system and slowly the breath begins to calm and as it begins to calm the life force that goes out to the senses begins to calm as well and it begins naturally as we focus deeply within at the point between the eyebrows upon the, upon the mantra naturally it begins to withdraw back to its home in the deep spine and as we do that the senses begin to go to sleep, you might say. Just as in nighttime, when we sleep at night, we're very perfect yogis at that time because we're not, we're not outwardly expressing and we're, we've withdrawn the life force from the senses. The only problem is, of course, is that we're asleep. We're not conscious. And we're, or you might say we're subconscious. We're in, we're, we're in dream state, or memory state. And so, but yet, the senses have done what is quite natural for them to do. And so when we meditate, what we're doing is the very same thing, is learning to withdraw that life force into the deep spine, but as a, in a conscious state. And then begin to uplift that consciousness up toward the brain. Now the techniques of Kriya, of course, build upon this very principle by learning to magnetize the spine through introducing a current of life force in accompaniment with the breath to create a magnet in the spine. And that magnet ha it augments that tendency of the life force to interiorize by withdrawing or attracting that life force in. Yogas Chitta Vritti Narod, that's the second stanza, beginning stanza of the Yoga Sutras. The neutralization of the waves feeling the waves of chitta. And what is that chitta? The chitta is the likes and dislikes, the subjective reactions of the heart, the heart's feelings to what takes place in our lives. And so as we begin to neutralize these currents, this upward and downward current that is associated with the inhalation of the breath and the exhalation of the breath, we slowly then begin to calm the senses and interiorize. Now, for us who are aspiring yogis, it's recommended, I think what we can all begin, yes, if you're, if you're a meditator, practice these techniques that uh, the masters teach us, uh, practice the energization techniques and the Yong Sao technique and the Kriya technique, if you're a Kriya bond, but in day-to-day -day life, even as a more beginning level, as we practice these techniques, try to become aware of the movement and the flow of life force in the spine. And notice, if you can, how by being aware of the, of the movement of life force, how that life force movement is in, a, is in association with your reactions to life. When you feel happy, ah, oh, I, I enjoy it. something good is happening. You feel, notice, try to be aware. Notice that, that movement up, that there's a feeling of upliftment that takes place when something positive is happening to you. And at the same time, notice when you're in a bad mood, you perhaps things aren't going right for you, you feel down. Notice 
the movement of life force. And if you, as you become aware of this movement of life force in association with this reactive tendency of the heart, you become sensitive to it. Now there's a very important principle that's going to probably be repeated many times as we have these discussions. In yoga we say awareness precedes control. Now our goal, let's say if you're practicing pranayama or to trying to control the breath or to control anything, in this case life force, currents, you need to be aware of something before you can control it. And so if we can learn to be able to be aware of our life force moving in, in the spine in reaction to what happens around us, try to feel that. If you're aware of your thoughts, if you're aware of the quality of your thoughts, if you pay attention, then, then there's a possibility of being able to control, not so much controlling the thoughts, but the energy behind those thoughts and the motivation for those thoughts. You can, become, you can get a grasp of it. And as we practice Kriya, as we practice these techniques of Paramahansa Yogananda, you'll see that this element of life force is in all of them. Becoming aware of the life force, becoming aware of the energy, and you'll begin to see that slowly you'll begin to bring them into control. Now, this brings us, and so I've been able to accomplish that, I want to move on to number 59 of uh, the Gita because it, it, it uh, also raises a very good point that's somewhat related and I've touched on already. In stanza 59, the uh, Krishna is saying, the man who merely abstains from sense enjoyments may forget them for a time, but for the taste of them linger. That person, however, who beholds the Supreme Spirit loses the taste for anything but the infinite. And this, of course, again, relates to that story I told about the, uh, the two monks just merely restraining the senses isn't enough. We have to not only we withdraw the life force that is activating the senses, but even that is not quite enough also. We need to then take it also to the next step. We have to withdraw that life force and we have to raise it up, that life force up to the brain, and to whatever degree that we can do this. Now, I mentioned uh, that sadhu, that elderly sadhu, and, and how this was not the way that Paramahansa Yogananda approached life, nor was it the way that Swami approached life. Swami, Swami and of course, being the disciple that he was mirrored the attitudes and the, the, the uh, expressions of his guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, they were positive in, in, in all of their expression. And you will find that the secret of being able to sustain your spiritual life, to be the secret to be able to live positively in this outward life, is not so much to put up blocks in your life. Although you need to be diligent, obviously, and use common sense, but rather to emphasize the positive side. Emphasize those things to which you are aspiring. To uh, Master had this wonderful saying in his, uh, in his uh, teachings when he would he speak. He says, once you have tasted good cheese, you'll no longer want stale cheese. And this is, this is the secret of being successful on the spiritual life, is go for those things that are joyful. Experience joy, and you won't want those things that are less than joyful. There was this story I told a few months ago to another group about Herb Jeffries, who was a disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda. And Herb had, had asked, uh, Master, he said, Master, in the Bible it says, Thou shalt not do this, and thou shalt not do that, this, that, and another thing. And, and he was struck by the somewhat, the language of don't do this or that. 
and he asked me, I said, what canst thou do? What is the positive, what, actually, what can I do in life, rather than what can't do and I'm not do in life? And Master looked at him, and, and he asked her, he said, uh, he says, do you smoke? And her Jeffries, who was a musician, and uh, sort of a jazz musician, and you know, kind of in a worldly environment is where he was doing his music. And he said, well, sir, yes, I do. And Master told him, he says, well, you can do that. So Herb was saying, you know, a, a bit mystified a little bit by that because he had never thought of smoking as being something that a, that a devotee should do. And then he asked the second question. He says, Master asked him a second question. He said, well, do, do you uh, drink alcohol? And Herb, who was in that environment, uh, said, well, sir, yes, I, I do. And Master said, well, you can do that. Now Herb Jeffries was really c confused. Because now smoking and drinking, now those are two things that are obviously all religious paths tend to dissuade people from that, and certainly yoga does as well. And here, Master was a great yogi, and he was saying that was okay, he could do that. And then uh, Master asked Herb, he says, well, do you, uh, do you like to associate with uh, promiscuous women? And Herb, not knowing quite what to make of that, said, well, sir, yes I do. And Master said, you can do that. And of course, now Mr. Jeffries was completely confused. But then Master said, but, I must warn you, I cannot guarantee that once you start to practice these teachings, you will not lose interest in all of those things. And I like that story so much because it showed how Master was emphasizing the positive. He said, if you, the important thing for the devotee is to look toward the light. Look into the light, and when you turn on the light, what happens? All darkness disappears. Turn on the light. So many people in religion, they look to the dark things and, and are, you know, saying, don't do this, don't do that, don't, and of course, of course, yes, we have to you might say tapasya or the, the redirection, being able to direct and control the direction of energy. Of course, we have to use common sense. We don't encourage bad habits or do you want to do this or that. You need to put a fence to some degree around yourself. But while you have that fence, you're concentrating upon the light. So Rama Krishna said in the beginning of the spiritual path, it's important to put a fence about yourself just as the, if you plant a tree, when the tree is young, you need to cage it, or else the wild animals and the elephants and, uh, will come and knock it over and destroy it. I know at our property in Pune, and of course in other communities I've been to, in the orchards, you always protect the young trees. But then, once he said, as Ram Krishna did, once the tree is grown, even the elephants can't knock it over. And so that's how it is for us. We look to the light. Look to the light. This, is, this was the uh, attitude of Master. He was always so joyful. He was always so embraceive of everything. And if you, if you have that spirit, it becomes infectious. And I know this is how Swami Kriyananda was as well. He would always, you know, when people would come to him and they would have they would have this trouble or that trouble and complain, he would he would he would give it too much energy. He would he would say, look to the light, do something positive, go to work, and serve other people. Even for people who would look not, uh, they would come and they would come, be so despondent perhaps of their own bad habits. If you have a bad habit, what you do is it's a matter simply a habit is simply the channeling of life force in a certain channel just as if water is flowing down a river or a hillside toward a river it begins to flow and begins to flow and it begins to cut a groove in that hillside you can try to you can try to block that flow but how much more positive and effective it is Instead of blocking that flow, learn to rechannel that life force into a different channel, you might say, but in a positive one. Something that's going to positively be able to 
help you go into a better direction. Speaking of habits, um, something Master would say, he says, people tend to form habits rather unconsciously. They tend to do something exactly the same every day. And although regularity is a, a positive virtue for sure, he said you should don't allow yourself to become a robot in that way. He says be, be creative, do something consciously just rather than simply unconsciously. And I remember uh, I used to uh, walk, let's say walking to work or going somewhere as part of my daily routine. I made it a point in my own life that is, I'd go somewhere every day and I'd begin to notice the path being formed in the grass or pathway that I was following is from time to time consciously go in another direction just not to be able to form that habit and you'll find that uh, he, just as Master wanted us to do is to keep ourselves fresh and to be able to act consciously and not to just uh, create mindless habits. So this is the this is the essence of what you could say Raja Yoga is learning to do is learning to be able to become aware of the flows of energy and learning to be able to withdraw those flows of energy and in control through awareness comes control just as that tortoise begins to withdraw that energy back into himself and then from that we begin to uh, we learn to control that energy and we begin to experience joy in life and the, and the positive things in life uh, uh, inside and we then begin to realize that being happy, being joyful, are at my command. Now I'd like to move to the, finally, one last stanza here. This is number, uh, chapter 2, number 60, and again it follows in this discussion. Arjuna, our Krishna says, O son of Kunti, Arjuna, even the wise man, devoted to self-control, may sometimes be swept away by turbulent senses. And then I just I'll read a little bit of, uh, of Swamiji's first, the beginning of his commentary, which goes, goes quite a, uh, for a page or two. No devotee should underestimate the formidable power of subconscious tendencies. Their tentacles are further reaching than anything the conscious mind can perceive or even imagine. And I wanted to, as I was speaking a little bit earlier, saying how to be, we want to be positive and how it's with common sense we have to be a certain amount of restraint on ourselves. I wanted to end with that one because I didn't want to leave the impression that it doesn't matter what we do in life, just that, that uh, just doing positive things and focusing on the light and to totally disregard and to be un, uh, unrealistic about the tendencies as, as Krishna is here of the subconscious mind, those tentacles that reach out. He said, or Paramahansa Yogananda said, that we cannot totally be safe on the spiritual path until the soul has reached that state of nirvikalpa samadhi. Not that lower state, which is the first state with of samadhi that is commonly experienced, which is known as sabhikalpa samadhi. Sabhikalpa samadhi is that samadhi that we enter into, we, as we're meditating, we go into that, uh, temporarily into that state of meditation during, or into that samadhi state during our meditation period. So the, the body becomes in, totally interiorized and somewhat and oblivious to the outside world in that state of samadhi, but then we come down from it and return to this outward, uh, this state. Whereas nirvikalpa samadhi is, to, is that state of samadhi that we reach when we are in the midst of action, in the midst of everyday life, we are in that state of nirvikalpa samadhi all the time, in the state of samadhi, in the midst of our ability to act in this world. That's the state 
that all of us are trying to achieve. That's also the state of Jivan Mukta. It's not until we have totally overcome the ego identity. You see, the soul entering into that state of samadhi transcends the ego temporarily, but yet then comes back into our ego identity and the attachments and all of the entanglements of it. Until we can transcend that ego, until we are totally free of it, we're not totally safe, as Master said. So all of us need to have that awareness and that even, even uh, great souls, but if they have not attained that state of Juma Mukta, need to be aware that the subconscious mind has very deep tendencies from the past. Paramahansa Yogananda and Swamiji also would, would say, sometimes you see people on the spiritual path, they're going along just perfectly fine, and they think all is clear sailing, and then all of a sudden, some deeply embedded karma from the past will come up in their life. Swamiji used to like to use the image of, of a person has come onto the spiritual path, and then deep down they always had the desire perhaps to be a great musician, and an opportunity to express that desire is nor was normally perhaps not present in this life, but that desire deeply buried, the, it comes up and they find themselves attracted. And if we're not careful, we're drawn off in that direction. So we must, we must be realistic about our, our situation, but yet at the same time, not be fearful of it. And to always, uh, the, the, um, the antidote for that is to be looking into the light and keeping the company of the Guru. And you can say this is the Guru's job is to protect ourselves, to protect us as the disciples from these, from these karmic bombs, you might say, that sometimes come off in our life and things happen in our life, is to just be, to be able to hold the Guru's presence. And if you feel you're with, consciously with you, dynamically with you, if you feel yourself in the aura of the Guru, you'll find that you will be protected. God will be with you. The Guru will be with you. I'd like to mention also in closing today that as we proceed through these Gita lessons, I invite you to ask questions. And send your questions in and at the conclusion, like now, of this class or this discussion, I like the word discussion better than class, at the end of this discussion I will uh, answer those questions. So if you have any, please feel free to send them in. But uh, if I don't, sometimes too many come in, or if I don't have time, or if I uh, don't stop in order to give people time to ask those questions, I will follow it up in the, the subsequent week. Or even if you care to, you can send your question in by email if you'd rather I do that. And I promise I will get back to you in email answering your question as best I can. Uh, do we have a question? Well, we do have a question and so I want to, these last uh, minutes, I want to uh, address those. So we have one question. The question is, please share with us if we can outwardly use any affirmations to overcome our habits. Please, yeah, uh, if you heard that, uh, it's the question was, can I share affirmations to use to help us to overcome any of our habits. And absolutely, now I've mentioned that this, I didn't go deeply into it because uh, this is a whole class in itself about changing habits and uh, so on and using affirmations as one way to use habits. But I'll, I'll, let me just say, give it a few minutes at least. Affirmations are the mental repetition of an affirmative phrase or a affirmative thought repetitively repeated and a person will sometimes uh, not understand why should I do that well it's we need to understand first off that each of us are affirming something all the time we are doing affirmations every day now 
we're sometimes not conscious of it, and perhaps by not being conscious of it, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem is we're not conscious of the affirmations that we are making, but we are. We're affirming a personality, we're affirming a gender, we're perhaps affirming identity with our occupation, we're affirming certain qualities, I'm this sort of person or that sort of, so that sort of person, oh I don't do that because I'm not that type of person to do that, or on the other side, I'm that type of person. And so all of us, hundreds, perhaps thousands of, as, uh, Parma, or as Swami Kriyananda we say, we're merely a bundle of self-identities, all of which we are affirming. And this continual reaffirmation of those embeds themselves within us. And so the process of affirmation, you could say the conscious application of affirmation, is learning to implant alternative thoughts, alternative identities uh, within ourselves. Now you might say, well, if we're supposed to transcend all identities, uh, isn't that just substituting one for the other? Well, of course, perhaps to some degree that is, and, and, but we can choose our affirmations, and if we use affirmations that are in tune with our true identity, then we have something that can be a secret to uh, our eventual success. Or you could even say, as Swami, or as um, Sri Ramakrishna said, if you have a splinter in your hand, a good technique is to take another splinter to pull that one out and then you throw both away. Now, for example, if you feel that you're, you're burdened, you can take a simple affirmation of I am free, I am free, in thy joy, I am free, or in thy light, I am free. Just mentally affirming that if perhaps you feel yourself to be bound by a certain habit or you feel yourself to be enslaved by some tendency, just re re repeating something like simple like that. Or, uh, I am positive, energetic, enthusiastic. I am positive as we often start some of our energization classes or uh, talks on energy and affirmation. Positive energy and enthusiastic as opposed to perhaps a mental thought that's going in your mind that you're the opposite of that or I am well, I am healthy, I am well, God's power runs through me, God's power, vitality, good health and strength flow through me, flow through me, God's power, vitality, good health and strength flow through me, flow through me. Once they flow through me as an affirmation of that's what's happening, but flow through me as a summons for that God's power to flow through us. And so there are many such affirmations. If you read Swami uh, Kriyananda has wrote, written a very uh, nice book on this, Affirmations and Prayers, 52, one for each week, that uh, you can say over and over again, or Paramahansa Yogananda's beautiful book, Scientific Healing Affirmations, of how to use affirmations to implant new thoughts into our mind, new directions into our mind, and in the, in the channeling of our life force in a new direction, it begins to uh, take that life force in uh, that channel, which is more positive perhaps, taking us into the direction that we want to go. The repetition of those uh, mentally, or first perhaps loudly, then in a normal voice, then whispering, and mentally putting power behind it. Now, when that, when Paramahansa Yogananda did this, he didn't do that. He didn't do it uh, uh, passively. He put power. How is everybody awake and ready? He put power into his words, and so it's the same way. We must do men mental and physical, verbal power into what we're doing. And we can rechannel any bad habit. You know, most habits are not that firmly embedded within us. Most people, why do they do something? Not because they intentionally, when they have, perhaps have a less than good habit, not because they intentionally wanted to do that bad habit. It's more that they drifted into it by omission rather than commission. 
And because they drifted into it, they didn't mentally affirm that bad habit. It was just a matter of passive repetition, you might say. So that's good because uh, uh, that means because there was little energy expended to create that bad habit, it's less embedded. And just a strong force of positive energy can quickly get rid of those. The more difficult negative habits are those that we've consciously chosen to take upon ourselves. We've, and there are such things that people do that. They consciously choose to be such and such a type of person, even though they know on a deep level perhaps it's not the best thing for them. So take something positively and affirm that. And perhaps even before that, look into your own self now. What are you affirming now? I mentioned that because remember what I said earlier? I said I'd repeat this over the weeks ahead. Awareness precedes control. Be aware of what it is you're thinking about right now. Watch your thoughts. Watch your identities. And, uh, and uh, pay attention. And then restrain it. And then repeat something positive, go to the positive, and you'll find that very quickly your life will begin to change and you'll begin to f drive out all of those negative influences uh, that are perhaps very subtly under the surface of your awareness influencing your behavior now. So next week we're going to pick up again with the Gita. We ended on number 60, I believe it was, and uh, next week we'll chapter 2, and we'll begin by stanza 61. I hope to see you then, and tune in again next Friday evening. Joy to you.